Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for our service today. My name is Janice Hirohama and I'm a minister's assistant at the Orange County Buddhist Church. I will be leading this service for OCBC and the Vista Buddhist Temple today, Sunday, March 14th, 2021. This will be the order of a service for today. We will start by chanting the Sanbutsuge. You can find it on page 33 of our service book and you can also download it from the ocbuddhist.org website. That will be followed by a musical offering, the Gatha Ondok San Tu. We will then recite selected saying number 24 on page 17 of the service book. I will give a Dharma talk, and then we will close with selected saying number 24 again. At the end, we will have some announcements. Before we chant, Please put your hands together in Gasho. Namo Amida Butsu. 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 Namo Amida Kogen Gigi Ijin Mugo Funyo Ze Enyo Muyo Tosha Nichi Gatsu Mani Chuko Enyo Hai Shitsu Onpe Yunya Fuju Moku Nyorai Yogen Chose Murin Choga Fudai on Koru Jipo Taimon Shojin Samai Chi E Ito Fumurio Chu Shoke U Jin Tai Zen and Chobutsu Hokai U Jin Jin no Hu Go Gai Tai Mu Myo Yokunu Se Son Yomu Nin no Shi Shi 
Jin to humurio Ukun kodai Ji e jin myo O myo iso Jin do dai sen Dan ga sa bu su zai sho ho o Ka do sho ji Mi fu ge da tsu fu se jo i Tai nin sho jin Nyo se sam mai Chi e i jo Go se to ku bu tsu fu gyo shi gan I sai ku ku I sa dai an Ke shi u bu tsu hya fu sen no fu man Mu ryo dai sho Chu nyo go ja Hu yo i sai Shi to sho bu tsu fu nyo gu do En sho hu gya hu hi nyo go ja Sho bu tsu se kai Bu fu ka ge Mu shu se tsu do Tom yo shi sho En shi sho ko hu nyo ze sho jin I jin nan diyo Yo ga sa bu tsu ko hu do dai i chi go shu ki myo Do jo cho ze tsu ko hu nyo nai on ni mu to so ga to ai min Do da tsu i sai ji po rai sho Shin ne tsu sho jo i to ga ko ku ke ra ku an non Ko bu tsu shin yo ze ga shin sho O tsu gan no hi Bi ki sho sho yo ku ji po se son Chi e mu ge jo ryo shi son Chi ga shin gyo Ke ryo shin shi Cho ku do ku chu Ga gyo sho jin Nin ju fu ke Na man da bu Na man da bu Namandabu 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 Gani shi Yo do se i sai Do ho tn po da i shin O jo
Namandabis, 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 Namandabis. Next, we will have our musical offering. Annette Inoue of the Vista Buddhist Temple will be playing the Gatha Ondoksan on the flute. Many thanks to Annette Anoe for that beautiful rendition of Ondoksan. We will now have our selected saying. Today it is selected saying number 24 on page 17 of the service book. Hard is the rock, soft the water, yet water wears away the rock. There is an old saying that if there is a will, even the attainment of Buddhahood is possible. No matter how little faith one possesses, if he listens earnestly to the teachings, he will attain faith through the compassion of the Buddha. Therefore, it is important that one listen earnestly to the teachings. Ben Yoshoni. Namo Amida Bhutsi. 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 Namo Amida So it's time for my Dharma message, and today I would like to talk about the quiet power of Buddhism. Namandabis, Namandabis, Namandabis. A while ago, I read a very interesting book by Susan Cain called Quiet, The Power of Introverts in a World That Can't Stop Talking. The book is about how American society admires and rewards people who are extroverts and overlooks and undervalues people who are introverts. It was a New York Times bestseller, so it obviously struck a chord with a lot of people. So what is an extrovert? What is an introvert? These are names for two types of people who have particular temperaments, meaning they have certain ways of relating to the world around them. Very simply, extroverts are people who are happiest when they are around other people. They prefer being in a stimulating environment with a lot of activity going on. Introverts are people who are more comfortable being alone. They thrive in a calmer, less stimulating environment. Here are some personality traits that can help you figure out whether you or someone you know is an extrovert or an introvert. Extroverts are outgoing life of the party type people. They like being the center of attention. They get energy from spending time with other people. They talk a lot. They're very action oriented and are quick to make decisions and act on them. They tend to be multitaskers who do more than one thing at a time. They really enjoy being in groups and they are verbally and physically expressive with louder, more animated voices, bigger gestures, the kind of people who like giving big hugs. In contrast, introverts are introspective, meaning they look within themselves at their own thoughts and feelings. They are more comfortable being in the background rather than the center of attention. They recharge their energy by spending time alone. They prefer listening to talking. They deliberate before making a decision or taking action. They like to focus on one thing at a time. They prefer interacting one-on-one -on -one to being in groups, and they tend to be quieter and less physically expressive. As you can see from this chart, 
America is a very extroverted country. According to some studies, 66% of Americans are extroverts and only 35% are introverts. So there may be twice as many extroverts as introverts in the U.S. It's important to remember that it is not better or worse to be an introvert or an extrovert. One is not superior to the other. They are just different types of personalities and each one has its own strengths and weaknesses. Many of us have a combination of introvert and extrovert traits, although we usually lean more toward one end of the spectrum than the other. The book Quiet describes how Americans tend to admire what the author calls the extrovert ideal. The ideal self, the type of person many people model themselves after and want to become, is extroverted and outgoing. Our society assumes that extroverts are successful, confident, happy, good leaders, all positive qualities. And because we put extroverts up on a pedestal, all too often introverts are overlooked and underestimated, thought of perhaps as shy, low energy, antisocial, and lacking in confidence. So you can see how it might feel like swimming against the tide if you're an introvert living in American society, where the majority of people are extroverts and where being extroverted is held up as the model. And it can be even more challenging if you're in a particular environment where being outgoing is so fundamental that it's built into almost every activity. One chapter in Quiet really caught my attention. It described how evangelical Christians, who are introverts, can struggle to fit into their religious culture, which has a very extroverted style. It quotes a minister, a self-described introvert, who said, the evangelical culture ties together faithfulness with extroversion. The emphasis is on community, on participating in more and more programs and events, on meeting more and more people. It's a constant tension for many introverts that they're not living that out. And in a religious world, there's more at stake when you feel that tension. It doesn't feel like I'm not doing as well as I'd like. It feels like God isn't pleased with me. The book got me thinking about introversion, extroversion, and religious practice. I want to be clear that I'm not criticizing any religion or saying that one spiritual path is better than another. I'm just taking some of the points from this book and using it as a kind of lens to see what insights it can give us about Buddhism. The extroverted culture of evangelical Christianity, as described in the book Quiet, includes the following aspects. Every person you meet is an opportunity to proselytize. Enthusiastic public expression of your religious feelings is expected. And there is an emphasis on talking, verbalizing, and socializing. Let's take that first aspect of evangelical Christianity, that every person you meet is an opportunity to proselytize. Proselytizing means to convert, or attempt to convert, someone to your religion. As author Susan Cain says in Quiet, contemporary evangelicalism says that every person you fail to meet and proselytize is another soul you might have saved. With those kinds of stakes, then, obviously it's vital to meet as many people as possible. Proselytizing or evangelizing is fundamental to many Christian denominations and other religions as well. They may have organized missionary efforts to reach out to people of other faiths or no religious faith. It is viewed as both a religious duty and an act of kindness and compassion. Proselytizing can take various forms. One example is when missionaries knock on your door, offer you religious literature, and ask to share with you about their religious beliefs. Another example is witnessing, when a person may meet someone in the course of their everyday activities, and he or she uses that opportunity to strike up a conversation to tell that person about Jesus by sharing their own personal experience. 
These are obviously activities, going door to door, talking to strangers, opening up about your personal experiences that would come naturally to an extrovert, but would be hard for an introvert. How does this contrast with Buddhism? Although we don't use the word proselytizing, what we call propagation has been an important part of the development of Buddhism. Shakyamuni, the historical Buddha, traveled around India for 45 years, sharing the Buddhist teachings and attracting followers. Through those followers and those who came after them, Buddhism spread throughout Asia and eventually came to the United States. Our Buddhist churches of America, which came to the U.S. over 120 years ago, was originally called the Buddhist Mission to North America. So it had a missionary or propagation aspect to its work. It was meant not only to take care of the spiritual needs of Japanese immigrants, but also to share the Buddhist teachings to people of all backgrounds who might be interested. So spreading our spiritual teachings is well known in Buddhism. However, it is not our style to evangelize or proselytize or witness. We can and do create favorable conditions for people who might be interested in Buddhism to come to us and learn more about it. For instance, we welcome visitors to our temple, we answer their questions, we make written information available for them, we offer classes on Buddhism. We put our services on YouTube that anybody can watch. But we don't take the initiative to approach strangers and try to convert them to our beliefs. Why is that? One reason is that because Buddhism is a path of experience, not belief. We don't ask people to believe a set of doctrines. Shakyamuni Buddha said that we should not accept a teaching just because we heard it from a person who is supposed to be holy, or because it is contained in a holy book, or because our friends and neighbors believe it. Rather, he urged us to observe and analyze a teaching for ourselves, to test it against our own experience, in our own lives, and see if we find that it is true for us or not. Then we can decide whether to accept it or reject it. If Buddhism is a path of realization and experience, it is something you have to discover for yourself. Someone else can't tell you what it will be like for you, or whether you will find it true in your own life, or whether it will work for you. So, while we can provide access to the Buddhist teachings and provide favorable conditions for people to study and learn more, it is up to the individual person to accept or reject them. Some say that Buddhism is a way of life rather than a set of doctrines. So as Buddhists, we really don't have something to convert people to. In a way, people have to convert themselves. They have to find the path and they have to walk that path. Also, Buddhism recognizes the impermanent nature of all things. We know that because everything is constantly changing, our desire to cling to things, such as our possessions, our relationships, our emotions, or our fixed ideas, will lead to suffering when conditions inevitably change. So we cultivate non-attachment. Among other things, we try not to, ve to develop attachments to ideas or religious doctrines. We are open to the possibility that our knowledge and our ideas can change. That means in Buddhism, we don't say definitively, I'm right and you're wrong. That is one reason why we don't think there's only one way to reach enlightenment or liberation. The saying is that there are 84,000 paths to enlightenment, and they don't all have to be Buddhist either. That may be why the Dalai Lama said, if you do adopt Buddhism as your religion, you must still maintain an appreciation for the other major religious traditions. Even if they no longer work for you, millions of other people have received immense benefit from them in the past and continue to do so. Therefore, it is important for you to respect them. 
so that respect for other religions and spiritual paths, which comes from our understanding of impermanence and non-attachment, keeps Buddhists from trying to proselytize. The second aspect of the extroverted culture of evangelical Christianity I mentioned is that it is the norm for people to publicly express their religious feelings and to do it with great enthusiasm and fervor. In the book, Quiet, here is how that introverted Christian minister described his experience at an evangelical church. It sets up an extroverted atmosphere that can be difficult for introverts like me. Sometimes I feel like I'm going through the motions. The outward enthusiasm and passion that seems to be part and parcel of this church's culture doesn't feel natural. Not that introverts can't be eager and enthusiastic, but we're not as overtly expressive as extroverts. At a place like this church, you can start questioning your own experience of God. Is it really as strong as that of other people who look the part of the devout believer? So you can see how being an introvert in that kind of extroverted setting can make you anxious about not fitting in with all the people around you who are expressing more outward religious enthusiasm and it might make you worry about being judged. Public displays of religious faith can take physical forms, such as clapping, dancing, kneeling, or lifting your hands. It might be verbal, such as singing, chanting, praying aloud, spontaneous exclamations, or shouting. We can find physical and verbal religious expressions across many different faith traditions. For instance, prostrating in prayer and touching the head to the ground in Islam, or kneeling in Catholicism and other Christian and non-Christian traditions, or singing hymns, or praying aloud. However, the evangelical approach that is described in Quiet adds an extra layer to physical and verbal expressions of religious feeling. As the book explains, in evangelical congregations Churchgoers are expected to show strong, obvious enthusiasm, passion, and exuberance. So, for instance, at church services, you might see people raising their hands, holding their Bibles up in the air, perhaps spontaneously shouting words of praise or affirmation, such as Amen or Hallelujah. The singing of hymns is loud and joyful. Reverence can be seen through enthusiasm that others can see and hear. Doing these things would clearly be easy for extroverts and more difficult for introverts who prefer quiet, who don't like being the center of attention, and who aren't as physically and verbally expressive. How do we do things in our Buddhist tradition? We do have practices that take physical forms, such as bowing, putting our hands together in das sho, and offering incense. We do use our voices when we chant, sing gathas, or recite the golden chain. But overall, our style is quieter. We don't make exclamations when we chant or jump up from our pews in the middle of the service and shout spontaneously. I have yet to see a Shin Buddhist minister give a loud, emotional, roof-shaking sermon. When we go up to do Oshoko, offer incense, that is a quiet and private moment of meditation with maybe a murmured namandaka. Why is that? Well, Buddhism is a path of self-examination. It emphasizes individual reflection, contemplation, and self-awareness. Those actions are, by their very nature, going to be quiet and even solitary. When you are engaged in self-reflection, you aren't concerned with what other people are doing. You don't worry about what they may be thinking about you in that moment. We are looking within rather than projecting outward. The focus is not on how we appear to others, but on gaining insight into ourselves. It's not that Buddhism disapproves of emotion, but we try not to get sucked into our emotional states. We know that emotions can interfere with the ability to see things clearly. Instead, we look at our emotions, 
examine them as a way of getting further insight into ourselves. So we tend not to put emotions front and center at our services or during our private moments of self-reflection. Self-reflection is also something that requires focus and concentration, and you need your body, your mind, and your surroundings to be quiet in order to concentrate. We've learned this during the pandemic, when so many of us have had to work or go to school from home. You've probably found that when you're working or attending a class from home on Zoom, it's really, really hard to concentrate when there is background noise, activity going on around you, and your family member is trying to get your attention. So, you know that when we are trying to calm and focus our minds to reflect, we need to turn down the volume, so to speak. When we make time and quiet space for contemplation and self-reflection, we can see and hear things that aren't obvious when we are talking, moving around, or interacting with other people. Chakyamuni Buddha sat alone in silent meditation for years before he had that breakthrough moment when he attained enlightenment under the Bodhi tree. In our own Jodo Shinchu tradition, Shinran Shonin went down from Mount Hiei to Rokkakudo in the city of Kyoto to sit alone in meditation for a hundred days. It was at dawn on the 95th day of his retreat that he had a dream that inspired him to seek out Honen Shonin and to hear the Nembutsu teaching. The third aspect of the extroverted kind of evangelical Christianity described in the book Quiet is the primary importance of talking and verbal expression to religious life. This model of evangelical Protestant Christianity makes use of public testimony and declarations of faith. That is in addition to the persuasive use of words in proselytizing or evangelizing or witnessing that I mentioned earlier. It urges people to publicly declare their faith and to testify or share their personal religious experiences. Talking is also a part of socializing, which is a crucial part of church life to create fellowship. So talking is central in that religious culture. In Buddhism, words are important as well. It is through words that the Dharma, the teaching, is conveyed to us. The words are contained in the sutras, in the words of our teachers, in Dharma messages. And we do our share of socializing too. At OCBC or VISTA, back when we were able to gather together in person, you would see a lot of friendly conversations and interaction. However, in Buddhism, listening is considered more important than talking. What is listening? It does not mean passively sitting and letting the words go in one ear and out the other. Listening is active. It is an intentional and deliberate activity. You are not just listening with your ears. You are listening with your whole being. This idea of deep listening has been a part of Buddhism from the start. When Shakyamuni gave talks to his followers, they listened intently. Those followers memorized those teachings, which they then shared and passed down orally from one person to another for hundreds of years. If something is not written down, and you have to rely only on your memory of what someone said, you have to listen very, very mindfully, very carefully. Centuries later, when what the Buddha said was eventually written down, using the words that were passed down through that oral transmission, each sutra began with the phrase, thus have I heard. One of the central ideas in our Gyodo Shinshu tradition is deep listening. What are we trying to hear? We are listening to the Dharma, meaning ultimate reality. We hear it as transmitted through the teachers and teachings, from the seven Pure Land Masters and all the teachers who came after them, until it reached us. We hear the voiceless voice of Amida Buddha, which is calling to us and saying, <coughs> Pardon me. Wake up to ultimate reality. 
To hear that voiceless voice, you have to stop talking and listen. I'm sharing this picture to remind us of one of Shakyamuni Buddha's most famous sermons. He stood in front of the crowd of his followers and held up a single flower without saying a word. The monks were puzzled. Why was the Buddha silent? And when was he going to speak? Finally, one of the monks, Maha Kashyapa, smiled, and the Buddha was pleased, for he knew then that Maha Kashyapa understood. No words were needed for the Buddha's teaching to be transmitted. This is an example of how silence can be more powerful than words. As the book explains, it can be hard to be an introvert in an extroverted religious culture, such as evangelical Christianity. Introverts might feel that they are somehow failing, not just socially, but spiritually, by not being outgoing enough, talkative enough, or emotionally and physically expressive enough. That doesn't mean that there's anything wrong with that religious path. It's just that it may be harder for some people, because of their personality types, to feel comfortable with the particular way that religion is expressed. Buddhism is a religious tradition with a more subdued, less outgoing style. From what I've said, you can tell that an introverted person would probably feel pretty comfortable at one of our temples. We don't go out evangelizing, proselytizing, or witnessing. We emphasize listening rather than talking, self-reflection rather than putting things out in the world. But some people might feel that Buddhism is at a disadvantage in America, where extroversion is held up as an ideal. We could ask ourselves, if we don't put ourselves out more, then are we invisible? In the American religious landscape? Will people find us? Will people listen to us? In her book, Susan Cain argues that introverts have a quiet power that is easy to overlook in an extroverted culture, but that is nevertheless strong, steadfast, and compelling. In another section of her book, she calls that kind of quality soft power and quotes an expert who says, aggressive power beats you up, soft power wins you over. Just as introverts should appreciate their strengths and feel confident in who they are, we should appreciate the soft power of Buddhism. Quiet doesn't mean lack of conviction, lack of belief, lack of confidence, or passivity. It shows a quiet, but powerful persistence and a belief in the substance of your message. You don't have to sell it, it speaks for itself. Let us appreciate and embrace the quiet power of the Buddhist path. Namo Amida Bhutsu, 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 Namo Amida To close, we will recite selected saying number 24 on page 17 again. Now you can see why I have chosen this particular saying. In my talk, I discuss the quiet power of Buddhism. As Ben Yoshonin reminds us, flowing water may seem soft and yielding, yet it has the power to wear away rock. And as Ben Yo says, no matter where we are starting from, if we listen earnestly to the teachings, the Dharma, we will be able to attain Shinjin, enlightenment. Let us appreciate that soft power, that quiet power that we find in Buddhism. Hard is the rock, soft the water, yet water wears away the rock. There is an old saying that if there is a will, even the attainment of Buddhahood is possible. No matter how little faith one possesses, if he listens earnestly to the teachings, he will attain faith through the compassion of the Buddha. Therefore, it is important that one listen earnestly to the teachings.
Namo Amida Butsu, Namo Amida Butsu, Namo Amida Butsu, Namanda Butsu, Namanda Butsu, Namanda Butsu. Thank you. Now we have some announcements, and today we have quite a few. This is our Dharma School schedule for today, March 14th. The classes meeting today are Sakura, Momo, Pre K, and Kindergarten. Yuri and Kikyo, second and third grade, Ume, fourth grade, and Ayame, eighth grade. Classes will start at 11 and end by 11.45. Next, we want to remind you of our Panda Express fundraiser today, March 14th. If you place an order online or using the app today, using the special code on the flyer, OCBC will receive 28% of the amount of your order. It's good at any Panda Express in the US. So if you can, please help us while enjoying some delicious food. We also want to remind you of our Spring Ohigan Seminar, which will be next Saturday, March 20th. The seminar features Dr. Nobuo Haneda of the Maida Center of Buddhism, and it will premiere on the OCBC YouTube channel at 9.30 a.m. OCBC is having a Fill the Hondo fundraiser for Hanamatsuri. You can order a photo cut out of yourself and your family members, and they will be placed in the Hondo pews for our Hanamatsuri service. See the flyer for details. We are looking forward to the day when we can meet in the Hondo once again in person. OCBC has an origami crane project with the goal of folding 3,000 cranes to display in the lobby of our hondo for our first in-person service, which we will hold once it is safe to do so. Details are on the flyer. Finally, if you are not a sustaining member of OCBC or the Vista Buddhist Temple, but are watching our online services and find them meaningful and helpful, we hope you'll consider becoming a member. Please see the screen for some additional announcements. That concludes today's service. Let's close with Gasho. Namo Amida Butsu. 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 Thank you all for joining us for today's service. Enjoy the rest of your day and have a good week. Spring is coming. <laughs>